Showing up and caring is all it takes to deeply influence the life of a child in need. That's according to Austin Angels founder, Susan Ramirez. Her organization provides caring mentors and support to foster families and children in the system, who in many cases have never had an adult take time to love them or show them that they are important. She does just that. Well, welcome, Susan. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about uh, Austin Angels and tell me then what you do and how you get started there. Oh, we started Austin Angels as a New Year's resolution back in 2010 just to volunteer in our community just one day a month and never really had a dream or desire to be running a nonprofit and now a national nonprofit. So I had gone to a conference um, early on in 2010, and the conference just forever changed my life. Um, I had always felt like adoption was going to play some role in my life, but didn't really know what that meant. And I stumbled into a foster and adoption conference. And I had a friend with me who had a breakout manual who said, hey, why don't you go and listen to this judge speak? He's going to be speaking on foster care. And I said, no, I'm not interested in foster care. I'm not really built that way. I don't know how to love on children, let them into my home and then have them be removed. And the friend said, well, you know, Susan, the interesting thing about foster care is that it's not really about you. It's about the children. And wouldn't it be nice for somebody like you to open up your home? I don't know how many times in your life, like the one decision you made completely changed the whole trajectory. But for me, it was going into that conference wow. because at that conference, I learned about all the statistics and things that um, plague the foster care system. And so that was the real impetus to um, take a direction of just wanting to volunteer one day a month and now solely focused on how do we recreate the way that children and families experience the foster care system. How did it come about yeah. that you decided to birth this program? One of the statistics that really just drive me for change is that on average, children in the foster care system will move seven different times in two years. So that's just on average. There's many children that over the course of their life in foster care will move 22, 23 different times, which is absurd. And every time a child moves, they're six months behind from an educational standpoint. That's why 50% of children will not graduate high school. Not to mention every time a child moves, it's new mommies and daddies, new sets of friends if they even make them, new teachers, new communities. And you know, every time a child moves, they pack up their grocery sack or their black trash bag full of belongings and they move from home to home to home. And the statistics say that 50% won't graduate high school, 97% will not go on to college even though they have a full ride to any state school, 50% um, of our homeless population spent time in foster care, and there's um, all different stats that say the majority of our prison population spent time in foster care. And so when we first started Austin Angels, it was how can we let children experience care differently? So we started by doing community service projects. We'd go into girls' homes and we would do days of beauty for them, have their hair done and makeup done, hire estheticians and nail techs. And it was great, but the truth is, is that we weren't changing the trajectory of their life. So they were still gonna age out at 18 and end up as a statistic. So in 2013, we, we launched our pilot program of the Love Box campaign. And we said, how do we rewrite those statistics? Because I believe that every single child should have the opportunity to grow up to reach their fullest potential. Um, it, it, we, it shouldn't be this way, and it doesn't have to be this way. And we can change it. So let's go back to Love Box. Tell us about it. And basically what it is, is we tell people, whoever you're already doing life with, whether it's your book club or your small group or your coworkers, you basically adopt an entire foster family and we match you based on zip code and what we would call a need assessment. And so some foster families need some additional financial support and some need more emotional support. So we match them based on a need assessment and then a dedicated love box leader. Now, just so like a few, for example, signed up for this, we would match you with a child and a family and you would go visit them once a month, every month for a year. And so we focus on three areas of impact in the program. The first is intentional giving. So if you got paired with little Jimmy and Johnny, for example, the majority of times when children get pulled from their home and they arrive at the new home, they have very little belongings. And so the love box leader would be responsible for making sure that the family had everything that they needed in terms of 
does Jimmy and Johnny have school clothes and um, their favorite snacks and cereal, things that they need, but also things that they want. Um, so the first area is intentional giving. The second area is relationship building. So if Jimmy and Johnny always wanted to be in baseball, um, then the Love Box group and the leader would sign him up for baseball, be there for games and practices, cheer him on. And then the last component is mentorship. And we um, look at whether they're two years old or 21 years old, doesn't matter to us that you can mentor a child. And that looks like reading to them, getting on the floor and playing matching games or flashcards, visiting them at school, you know, just having somebody accountable that says, hey, I care about you and I care about your grades and we want you to graduate and we will walk this journey with you. And for our older kids, that looks like getting a driver's license and opening up a bank account and beginning to prepare them for adult living. What a beautiful idea. Instead of just giving something one time, right? That's right. There, there's a commitment. I'm just curious. Have any of your love box groups stayed with a child? We're not interested in just putting a Band-Aid on a problem. And we know that kids need backpacks and they need beds and they need things. But what they need more is a dedicated person that shows up in their life over and over and over again and says, your life matters and it matters to me. And that's, I think, what makes our program so unique and so special because these kids are so special and they deserve to have somebody who knows the color of their eyes and the passions of their heart. Our hope is that we require a minimum of a year, but once the adult you know, falls in love with the kid, we hope that they stay with them forever. We believe in relational permanency, and that's what we're really striving for. So, for example, I have a girl named Lisa that I have sponsored for three years, and now she is in her 20s and just had her first child. And so, you know, she calls me all the time about, you know, my son has pink in his eye. What does that mean? I'm like, that's pink eye, and we need to get him to the doctor to get an antibiotic. You know, just because you're 18 years old and age out of the system doesn't mean that you have it all figured out. In fact, I don't know many 18-year-olds that have it all figured out. And so the hope is that we have a relationship with them forever. And that mentor is there for them. Yes, exactly. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So tell me, uh, there's another program that you have that's when the children are older, right? Or when Yes, so that's our Dare to Dream program. And what that looks like, it's a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program for the child. And in our mentorship program, they have to hit 10 milestones. So they have to go through a process in which they get their driver's license, they open up a bank account, and then they work with the mentor one-on-one -on -one to assess where do we go from here when you age out at 18. So we give them basically three options. You're either gonna go to trade school, you're gonna go to college, or you're gonna go to a branch of service. Which one of these do you want. And many times they're like, I don't even know. So the mentor will take them on recruitment trips and meet with different military recruiters or go and sit and do a presentation with welding school or plumbing school or beauty school. Um, you know, we know that college is not for everyone, but aging out of the system and not having a plan or going and working at McDonald's is not a lifelong sustainable plan. So we know that if we can empower children and educate them and be a resource for them, that they can rise to their fullest potential. You talked about two different young men yes. who, were in the, who were in the foster care system. Yes. So um, Jonathan was a part of the pilot program that we launched in 2013. And this was really, I think, the impetus to get it out so that every child could be a part of our program was because in that home, Jonathan, the foster mom, had said to us when we first got started, hey, I want to tell you about Jonathan. Um, out of all the boys that I've had in my home, and I've had over 50 children come through my home, he is the worst case of abuse and neglect of any boy that I've ever had. And so the mom had said that, in fact, when she got his file, she had only gotten through the first two pages and had to shut it and put it away because it was so horrific. And this young man had been in many, many placements in his young life. And in this particular home, it was the last stop before you would end up in a residential treatment center. So it was, you know, it's a pretty therapeutic, intensive home. And so um, Jonathan, when we started with him, you know, he had no self-esteem whatsoever, couldn't even look at you in the eyes. And so for the first couple of months, it was kind of like, what are you doing here? Why do you want to love on us? I don't really understand or get it, you know? And um, the, we had just worked with him month after month after month, kind of building up his self-esteem. It was back to school time. And so we had given Jonathan and all the boys in the home a brand new backpack. We had written like a Dr. Seuss quote on a card. And we said, Jonathan, we hear that you want to go out for the football team. And he said, I do, but it's never going to happen for me because I don't make good grades. And you have to make good grades in order to make the football team. And we said, Jonathan, we just believe that this is your year. And we want you to take that little encouraging note 
we want you to put it on your poster board bed. And every morning when you wake up, we want you to read it out loud to yourself and know that we have already, you know, thought about you and prayed before you. And like, we believe that this is your year. Every morning, Jonathan would wake up and he would read that out loud to himself. And he went to school and his mama called us at progress report card time and said, Susan, you are not going to believe this. But the little boy who has no self-esteem, the little boy who doesn't believe in himself, just brought home his progress report card and brought home straight A's. And that was really special to us because what we realized in the pilot of the program is that we just made a little boy believe in himself for the first time. And now he's getting ready to graduate high school and he's been on the football team successfully and we've been there to cheer him on at games. And you know, I think the sky's the limit for him. When a child believes that they're worthy and a child believes that they can rise to their fullest potential, they go there. But if they believe that nobody loves them and that who are they and they don't deserve anything, then they stay there. And so it was a real mind shift for Jonathan and um, that was a real, real, incredible experience for us to be able to witness that. And then another little boy in the same home, um, his name is Ryan, and Ryan is real special to me. Um, And he uh, was put into the foster care system. His biological mom had some mental illness and never really could, could tackle that and handle that and um, ended up on the streets. And so Ryan went into the foster care system and um, just an incredible young man. And he had been in the system for many, many, many years. And he was actually in that home for a few years. And so we do big things for birthday parties because we want to make sure that these kids feel so loved and validated. Well, that day I wasn't able to be there, but we made a huge love box for him. And he knew that when he got home from school that day, he was going to get to open up a box and it would have all his goodies in there. And so he called me when he got home from school and he said, Miss Susan, oh my goodness, I just wanted to tell you that I was so excited to get home from school today. I was so excited to get home from school because I knew that for the first time in my life, somebody was celebrating my birthday. And when he hung up the phone, he said, and I love you. And that was really special because the foster mom called and said, you know, Susan, that boy has been in my home for years and he has never said the words, I love you before. And so just to make a young man, you know, feel loved um, and then to be able to express love back is just powerful. And so we knew when those two things happened that we had to launch the program. And there were so many other outcomes that came from the home. And I believe that's the proof in the pudding. You know, I believe that when a child Mm -hmm. feels loved and seen and fully heard and known um, and they feel special and desired, like we all want, um, then they rise to their fullest potential. So I'm proud to say that we have a hundred percent graduation rate and, um, and there's just so many blessings, you know, that's an amazing change. Is it not? Yes. hundred percent graduation. So how have you expanded? In 2016, we piloted our first program and we ran it all of 2016 and all in 2017. And then in 2018, we launched it and we had um, 10 chapters at the end of last year all over the country. And we have 15 chapters that will come online in 2019. But the goal is to reach every child in foster care. So we have a pretty aggressive, ambition, ambitious goal. And that is that we want every child and every family served in our program. How's the program been recognized then? We have a partnership now with the University of Texas. Their social work department is walking alongside us and they're researching us right now because there's so much validity in our program and now we need to prove it. And so having that research is going to be a huge game changer for us. Yeah. And then we also have people in the child welfare world that recognizes it and sees it as a value. We have a partnership with the state of Texas and so we get direct referrals from the state of Texas as well as every single placement agency in central Texas. I want to go back to one of your statistics because one of the things that I've um, been uh, an advocate for and worked with is is to stop human trafficking in the state yes. of Texas. Yes. Um, and uh, I I heard one of your stats that you said in one of the... Um, so what is the statistic? So we know that 66% of our children who age out of the foster care system within one year will die, be human trafficked, end up homeless, or prison. 66%. So the odds are stacked so against you in the system. And that's what we're trying to rewrite. So as a culture, to focus on 
stopping that that's right from happening right that's right rather than dealing with it after that's right it has happened yeah so exactly that is exactly what you're doing you know, oftentimes people are like oh foster care you know I, I don't have anything to do with it but but actually everybody has if you pay tax dollars then it greatly affects you um, for sure mm-hmm. it's a billion dollar you know on our on social welfare services it's it's a billion dollars you can either care now and play a role or then it's a problem later. And so we talked about statistics earlier, our homeless population, our prison population, our human traffic population, um, the amount of girls by the time they age out, you know, 75% of them by the time they're 19 will be on their second pregnancy, and 75% of those children go into care. And so it's this cycle um, that I believe we can break. And I believe it doesn't have to be this way. And you know, we're in Austin, which is the hub of homelessness. And so what would it look like if we just wiped out 50% of our homeless population? Or what would it look like if 80% of our prison population all of a sudden was gone? You know, what would that do to our tax dollars? And not only that, this is human capital we're talking about. Every child deserves the opportunity to grow up and contribute back to society. And these kids want a hand up, not a handout. And that's the difference. And it does make a difference, doesn't it? Yes. It's to take them and change the life rather than just try to pay for something to right. later, right? But I mean, to actually change their lives and change the trajectory that they're on. How many children have y'all been able to reach then? We started with six boys. Wow. Yeah, we started with six boys. Yes. And so last year we served 1,068 children and that's amazing, but there's this gap between where we are today and where we need to be. And so our goal is to serve every child and every family, not only in Central Texas, but across the nation. So nationally, there's 423,000 children on any given day in the foster care system. And in Central Texas, there's about 5,600. So when you think about the thousand we have served, there's a, we have a long ways to go. But you know what? We're going to get there. I just appreciate your work so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for... Uh, not only your calling, but for answering it and for yes. stepping up to the plate the way you have. It takes normal people to just walk alongside. You know, oftentimes people are like, well, you know, who am I to volunteer? Um, but the truth is, is that they don't need you to be extraordinary. They need you to be just ordinary and show up, you know? And I tell people, can you read? Because if you can read, you can go and sit with a three-year-old who's never been read to before. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just showing up consistently and that's that's where the real change happens. I'm just really honored to interview you. Thank you. Honored to spend some time with you.